Mordechai Holtz taking, uh, replacing for just for a few more weeks, uh, Charles Sakal. And we are, uh, anyone who wants to put in their kilot for a refua or any good things that they need, or any extra uh, tefillot that they need, the Vizera Shimshon promises that anyone who learns his Torah, that not only will they see their son, will their children sit on the turn- table learning ter- Torah with them, but everything, all good and all uh, good, uh, all good and benevolence will be p- passed down, and hopefully Bezrat Hashem, uh, the tefillot, the, the bracha of the Zerah Shimshon should, fall, it should reside upon all of us and all those people who need the, uh, their tefillot and yeshuot. Anyone who wants to send in their tefillot, yeshuot, requests with names and anything else, they can send us to at the Zerah Shimshon across all social media channels. Exactly. Uh, and we'll be happy to add them to our tefillot and to the... Uh, the rabbi's tefillot, Rabbi Yisrael Silverberg. And yeah. also uh, we bring the names to the Ainuka. And to others to rip on him as well. Yes. So, okay. So we're now we last in last part one. We did. Parsha. If nothing works, we're still learning Torah. Exactly. That's true. That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else, the Torah is really the best. The best protector. Best segula. Best segula. So, anyways, in last week's uh, last the last in part one, we did a to- piece of Torah from Parshat Matot, and now we're going to do a part a piece of Torah from Parshat Masay. In this week's parsha, which is almost always read together, um, to finish the sefer Bamidbar before uh, Dvarim, which is always read the, the Shabbat before Tisha B'av. So, wow. parsha Dvarim is always read before Tisha B'av. Dvarim is always read before, and Vayit Chanan is always read the, read the first parsha after. So, Matot Masay is almost always read together, so that we kind of fit it into the um, equation. Either which way. Parshat Masay is filled with the first, most, the most famous part of Parshat Masay is the 42 travelings, the 42 pieces. Uh, Which 42 Torah are we Masay? Masay? We're going to be doing Torah Aleph. Masay Aleph. Masay Aleph. Aleph. So the question, the, the, the Masay is all about this, the, the journeys of which Bnei Israel took throughout the desert. And there are many, many, the Farshim and so many different components of this, uh, of this Parsha Y42. Everyone's personal journey. This is just an example of so many of our own journeys that we have to take. Um, so the Zerah Shimshon has a very unique explanation, uh, not about individuals, but really about one of the pieces of uh, the Zerah Shimshon in gen- general, just a little bit of background. The Zerah Shimshon, Zerah Shimshon in general likes to understand how two parts of the Psukim are related. We learned that in the last one, also with last week, the last Torah that we just went through from Matot. He also asked a similar question. He's un- trying to understand what's the connection. Because there are two parts of the Pasuk usually can be broken down. Almost any Pasuk can be broken down to two. And he's trying to understand how part one and part two are related. Especially when it's not just, and God spoke to Moshe, and to say, right? But rather, there's, a, there's, a, there's something in there. And if we look at the Pasuk that he's going through to look at, the Pasuk is Periklam and Gimel Pasuk Dalit. And it says, and that's the, the Pasuk kind of stops. And then it says, So it says, in English it says, And the Egyptians were burying those among them who Hashem had struck, that is, every firstborn, and their gods, Hashem, had inflicted punishments. So the two parts of the Pasukim, the two, two parts of the Pasuk don't seem to be connected. One is based, the Mitzrayim were were dealing with their firstborns who were just killed. Mm-hmm. And then the second part is that Hashem took care or hit or, you know, did something to their gods. But there's no, you know, it's like there's like a, a few words missing in between those two parts of the Pasuk and, Hashem, and then Zerah Shimshon is going to ask what's going on here. So it says, Hashem <laughs> Shvatim, so the question he asked a similar a simple question: What is the connection between the fact that Ben Israel were burying their firstborn children with the fact that their gods were, you know, Hashem did some sort of miracles with their with these gods? No real connection in the pasuk, and we're trying to figure out what what it is. The Katab HaBechai, Rabbeinu Bechai in Parshat Bo says. So 
The Rebbeinu Rechaim says in Parsha Bo, when it was actually when the story of Makap Rachol is told, uh, is told to us, the Rebbeinu Rechaim says is that at night they didn't feel the, the they didn't really see what Hashem did to their what Hashem did to the gods, because at night what were they so busy with? They were busy with dealing with their children that were just you know unfortunately killed. What's the difficulty? <clears throat> the difficulty is there's a, a there's a, a disconnect between the two parts of the pasuk. Yeah. The part part one is He's inflicting pain, pain on upon the, the children and the Egyptians. While were, the thing says the next one says they were afflicted <laughs> upon their gods. Was, uh, yeah. Right. So now he has to explain what he has. He's his underlying question is what's the connection. So now he has to say, is if there, if I have to understand what the connection is, because it doesn't make sense that the pasuk, pasuk would just be two pieces of a, you know, two separate things. So he says, start with, he says, is that the Rabbeinu Bechai in Parshat Bo says that at night the Mitzrim didn't really understand, they didn't really, uh, didn't grasp how great the 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 makah, the, the the plague was, because they were so busy with the makah bechorot, they were so busy with the fact that their children were killed, that they didn't even see the fact. That Hashem also punished their their God. Only in the day, next the next day, when next morning, when they went to their house of worship, then they say, Oh, now we get it. Now we get what just happened. And in time of Klishtim, Dagon, do you learn about Dagon? Not Dagon, Dagon. Oh, it's about it's already, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is my pronunciation. Some kind of fish thing. Right, right. So Dagon was a Dagon was a famous uh, in the time of Yeshua. Uh, sorry, in the time of Shmuel, the Aron Abrit was stolen, and by uh, by Dag, by Dagon, and they placed the Aron into the house of worship. And when they brought it into the house of worship, the at this idol fell. And they put it back up. It fell again. They put it back up. They fell, but you know, a couple of times it goes back and forth, and they didn't make the connection that the fact that the Aron was in this house of worship was what was causing the um, the idol to fall. They didn't get the message. If we look at the actual Makat Bechorot, it never mentions the fact that their God was was Hashem punished their God because. They were so busy. Yeah, mm-hmm. he never mentions it. Mm-hmm. So he's saying they were so busy with their bichorot, with their children that were just killed, that they didn't even think about the. They didn't even think about the, their God. Jewish level of life. Yeah. And when trouble hits us, right, we immediately think of Hashem. Right. Baruch Dayo Not not that we should ever experience. We're supposed to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. We're supposed I mean, to do that. <laughs> and we were supposed to do that, right. and they couldn't even think about it. Right. So that that's what that he that that whole part was quoting Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, but now, if you look at the pasuk beforehand, <laughs> the pasuk before, right before this pasuk, which we just mentioned, which is the one that he has questions with, it says here. So Bnei Israel leave Ram says on the first day of which is Pesach. That means the day after Pesach. Yatsu Bnei Israel biad Ramah. They, they were with all their glory and they did it in front in the eyes in the faces of Egypt. So he says the Zerah Shemeshon says Kasha Bishlama Imayam Amtima Boker Acha Yuye Leine Olam Nicha. He says it would have made sense that Bnei Israel would leave Mitzrayim so that way ever in the middle of the day. Why? So that way everyone can see, the whole world will see it. But he says, no. Right? Had Hashem waited till the morning, then so for everyone to see, that would have made sense. To do it at night, he could have done it only if he was just trying to show to prove the Egyptians wrong, then he could have done it at night too, right? Right? When what happened? At night, when the when the, the kapachor was taking place, they were all busy with their children, so they were just been like, "All right, just get out of here, just get out. We don't want, we don't care about you. You're not important right now. We have to deal with our own children." In fact, maybe more. If you think about it, why did Hashem wait till the next day? 
had he, he shouldn't be waiting for the next day. Why should he not wait for the next day? Because maybe the next day they would have had time to process what just happened. Maybe we just, the previous nine makot should just go at night. Right. And then wait for the morning. But so that's the thing. So he's saying, why did we wait? We shouldn't have waited. If we wait, what's going to happen is they're going to they're going to regret, like just like they did the other nine makot. Mm-hmm. Every one of them, they regret it. They said, yeah, yeah, go out, go out, go out, and then tell you, wait a minute, now forget, I'm, I could take you back. I'm over it. Yeah, I'm over it. Go stay. So why did Hashem say go? It says here, Yom Lachodesh Hashem Machar Pesach Yitzur Beis Abiyad Ramah Leinei Kol Mitzrayim. So he's asking, why does it have to say Leinei Kol Mitzrayim? He could have done it at night when Bnei Yisra- when Mitzrayim were all dealing with their own problems, and then they would have been like, all right, just get out of here. We don't want we don't care about you right now. We got to deal with our own problems. But they did it in front of everyone. So he's saying he has a question. Lachin Ba Katuv Betirets. When did they really feel the destruction? They don't feel the destruction at night. They didn't feel the destruction at night. They felt the destruction and the real destruction of what Hashem did was during the day. Only the next day. At night, it was just that they were saw that their children, unfortunately, were, were killed. But they didn't process how much Hashem really had, what Hashem really did, until the next morning when they had to go to their, you know, their house of worship and they see what Hashem did to their idols. So Hashem said, "No, there was nothing to worry about because they really didn't." Uh, it says here, right? Israel." So he says, this is the reason why the two psukim are connected. The two psukim, the psuk, pasuk, in this, in the case of the uh, in Parshat Masay, it's pasuk Gimel and Dalit. Why these two psukim are connected? Why are they two connected? How are they two connected? The two connected is because Hashem wanted specifically from the, the Mitzrayim to see on during the day that Midian Israel are leaving. So even when they're the most upset, which is when they see that their gods were destroyed, they see how much Hashem has power. <clears throat> Right? In other words, at night, it could have been easily done that Hashem said, get out at night. Leave right now. Go out at night. And the Mitzrayim would have probably been like, sure, get out of here. I don't, I don't care. Because they were so busy, whatever. But Hashem wanted to show them, Hashem, Hashem wanted to make a point to meet the Mitzrayim that specifically now, during the day, when you're all upset because of what, Hashem, what I just did to your gods and to your, you know, your idols and whatever, I want to show you and really show you who's boss. <coughs> Maybe he's showing it to Israel. I am showing it to Israel too. Israel. Yeah, yeah, as well. So Israel, you're yeah. going when they see you. Right. Don't, don't run at night. Right. It's actually, you're right. It's, it's both. It's both parts. One is to show me trying, and one is to show me Israel saying, is, Look who's boss. I'm taking you out when they should be the most upset, and they're not going to do anything. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, now it says here for Ati Shapir, now we can understand why it says Biyad Rama. Riyad Ramah is like with a, what did you say here? Riyad Ramah, he explains it on, he says here, uh, the children let, went forth with an upraised hand. That doesn't really say anything. An upraised hand means they were, went strongly and proudly. Here, it says Riyad Ramah. In every other place, we've talked about Riyad Chazakah with a strong hand. Here, it's like, an, it's like a, a powerful, a, exor, exorbitant hand, like a, 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 a sense of pride as opposed to a, str- a strength. He's saying is that Ram means also powerful and lofty. Every other place it says Hashem used a strong hand, a heavy hand. Here it says Hashem used a lofty hand, meaning he wanted to prove to them that he is the lofty of the lofty, meaning he is the highest uh, power. And therefore, because he is the highest power, Hashem used, Hashem wanted to prove to them that this is really the, um, this is the, that he is that, that he is that power. And if we look, the only other time that really the word Yad Ramah is used is in right before Az Yashir. It says, right. This is something I never thought about, honestly. When we look at the Psukim of Parsha Bashalach, the beginning of Bashalach Bashalach, it says, It says, You should stand in front, you should stand. Hashem made them go around, like circle back, basically. To be trying, circle back and stand in front of Balzafon. So now, up until about a week ago, 
I thought Baal Tzephon was just like a name of a place. The what name of it? It was just a name of a place. A name, a name. Name of a place. According to Zer Shimshon, I'm sure he's quoting it from somewhere. He didn't say where, but I'm sure it's like a Midrash or something. Baal Tzephon was one of the gods of Egypt. And therefore, Hashem said, stand right there in front of that God of Egypt, who is like the last remaining God that we didn't do anything, to, I didn't do anything yet to. Stand right there. And what Mitzrayim is going to say is, oh, the last, my last God is going to do something to you guys. And Hashem says, you stand right there so that I can show, I can show the Mitzrayim who's really in boss. I want B'nai Israel to stand there so that when I do something to them, even in front of that Baal Tzaphon, Mitzrayim is going to be like, whoa. Yeah, they're going to be blown away. It couldn't be so obvious. Because when you're saying it, I'm like, can you imagine you, your father comes in and he's like, don't worry about it. I got an army. See those guns? I got all sorts of money in the bank. Not going to be a problem. You're not going to... It's not a... I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's um, clearly couldn't be as clear to them. To so us, yes. No, right. Hindsight. No, you're right. You're right. It, you're right. But it's, it's just, I think the real the goal here is really to, as Eric Shimshon is trying to say to, to us, at least, he's trying to say is that the word Yad Rama is only used twice, basically, in the part, in the Torah. What word? Yad Rama. 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 A, la, a lofty hand, a, a, a wondrous hand. And so it has to be, there's a reason for it here and in Parshat Peshalach, which is when they actually leave, that they use that word. So he's saying is it was used specifically in those two times, it's used specifically these two times, so that Hashem was <coughs> trying to show whose hand is really the loftiest hand of all. I Meaning Hashem was trying to prove to everyone that his power is over everything. So it has to be somehow not very obvious. I mean, we're living in the times. Uh, when I started learning here, was that <clears throat> one thing that struck me is that we're going in circles. Because what Zara Shoshana is talking about in Torah is what we're experiencing now here. You know, you and I, everybody here, are like, wow, miracle. Avram, Avram Avinu could have been sitting on the stone where this house is built. Right. And whatever. Um, but it's not so obvious because there are plenty of people that are like, yeah, whatever. very nice. We'll send a child here for you. Okay, and therefore, I'm just saying that it's uh, it, it reads to us like an obvious thing. Hashem came, strong hand, all the people no, died, just, blah blah blah, and uh, it has to be. No, there had to be some not sort of, so obvious to them. Right, it had to be. Op- no, that's the thing. The Mitzrayim really didn't believe that they believed that their gods, even though the, Hashem destroyed all their other gods, they believed that their god, in some way, was going to do something to right, kind of... He'll, he'll to, retaliate with nuclear. Right. So, he, therefore, he, they, Hashem said no, and that's exactly the point, what he's saying here is exactly the point is why Hashem made them go around back to Baal Tzifom. You know, when, he, when they left, he basically said is go up and back around. So, the obvious question is to why? So Hashem says is the reason why he wanted the Yazar Shimshon is saying, why did he go back? Because he wanted to prove to the Baal Tzaphon, which is the name of the God, which is the last remaining God after Hashem destroyed all the other gods, Hashem wanted to prove to him, even this God, that you guys are, this is like your last, you know, prayer, I'm going to take care of him too. And I want B'nai Israel to see in front of them, Mitzrayim, that even Mitzrayim, who is, has a lot of confidence and belief in that one, you, B'nai Israel, you're going to walk right through. Nothing to, have, nothing to worry about. And it had to be a very serious, strong, whatever, the angels that they, they, they you know, wouldn't know then. Because I, <clears throat> as far as I remember, Moshe was like the only one who was able to actually get through and get out of Egypt. Because the, whatever the spiritual forces they were using in Egypt, somehow, Envelope the entire country and nobody could get out. Okay, so then how did Bnei Israel get out? And he was able to get out, which is o- open the door for everyone else. No, like whenever he ran away, ah. in the initial. Okay. Open the door. In other words, yeah. it's not as simple as it sounds when you read. Yes, that's true. Child. That is true. 
Now, I don't know why am I interrupting you. So okay. I don't know why you know. now we have now this now there's an, now he takes a, there's a plot twist. So if we look now it says Aval Yisrael kibul alehem din shemayim b'simcha shemaytu krovehem. So up until now we were talking about when Hashem punished B'nai the Mitzrim and how the Mitzrim didn't realize the punishment and the gravity of the punishment until the next morning when they went to their house of worship and they see all the gods destroyed and they're sad about their firstborns. And now all of a sudden he takes a, he switches direction and he says B'nai Israel accepted their punishment as well happily. What punishment is that? Yeah. Okay. So th- this is something he says here. In the time of the Makat Choshech, there was light in there, right? It says, it says in the Makat Choshech, it says, so he says that B'nai Israel had light in their Moshevotam, meaning in their residence. What does it mean, B'moshevotam, meaning in their house? He could have just said, is they had a light. Right, if we're trying to say, if the Pasuk was trying to say is that B'nai Israel had light and the Mitzrayim had, Mitzrayim had darkness, so just say B'nai Israel had light. And we would have understood that they have light and they have darkness. <laughs> but the fact that it says that they have light in their residence, there's got to be a reason for that. So the, the Mizar Shem Shon is, is picking up on something that's a... They paid their uh, They paid their bills, exactly. So it says here, Mashi <laughs> So we know there's a famous address what happens. Why was there darkness? And what does it mean that they had light? Is that when Bnei Israel in, in the darkness, Bnei Israel would go into the Mitzrim's house and they would see with their light that they had, they would see where they kept all their fancy jewelry. And that way when later, when they left, they would say, if we don't have any jewelry, be like, what are you talking about? In this stone, in this stone, in this stone, in this stone. I see your bank account. Yeah, I see your bank account, exactly. And then, the, the Ersim Shalom brings another interesting point, is that what happened to B'nai Israel during the time of darkness? Hashem had a little pity on us, and there were a lot of Jews that deserved to die. Right? During that time, four-fifths, four-fifths of B'nai Israel were destroyed, were... Every time, from... Babylon, they also did. Right. So four fifths of the of the people in Makat Choshech, <coughs> four fifths of the Jews in Makat died in Makat Choshech. So the Zerushim Shon is saying is, I don't understand. From one side, you're saying they had light in their house, and they were supposed to be going around looking for the Mitzrim's, you know, secret, you know, safes. But on the other side, they're supposed to be sad and you know sitting on the floor for the sadness of the distra- all the all these four fifths of the nation. Four fifths of your classmates. Exactly. Four, gone. Right. So Jews, not just right. right exactly. That's what you're saying. So how, how, could, how could they be walking around like looking for searching for gold if they have four fifths of the people dead or dying? Right. He says that there are four fifths of the Jews. They shouldn't be looking around looking at their houses and you know looking for gold. They should be sitting on the floor sad. Percentage wise, it's even worse than Shrach. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> so he says that he brings another Shulchan Aruch. It's interesting that the two Torahs that we brought today are the ones from the Shulchan Aruch. But, anyways, he says, Right? And he says, What does it mean? Now, this is a tough statement to accept nowadays. Um, but in the time of the Shulchan Aruch, he said is that the people, people who basically denied and disregarded all that had to do with Judaism, we have no obligation. The Shulchan Aruch is saying this. I'm not saying this. I'm just quoting. We have no obligation to sit Shiva for them. In fact, the opposite. If they died and they were observant or whatever that means, Therefore, we should actually be doing this. We should be, in some ways, quote unquote, happy. Is that, that's what he says. We shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. But he says here, he says, levanim means wearing white clothing, which is a sign of happiness. And also, smechim, he uses the word smechim. So he says here, So he says, the, mitzvot, the Jews, the Jews. The Jews that were de- that were dying, <laughs> the Jews that were dying in the Makat Choshech, the, the ones who were still alive, the, the ones who were still alive were not uh, upset because they knew that these people that were dying, the four fifths that were dying, 
were people who didn't want to leave. They didn't want to be part of the Jewish nation. In other words, they deserve, quote unquote, they deserved what they, they were getting what they deserved. So therefore, being so, so, just but it's what they are. They really? deserve to die for that. No, but, but they, if they're gone, like they're gone. No, but they accepted it. They, according to what he's saying here, look what it says. Okay, okay, okay. 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 No, we're going to cry. We're going to be happy about mm-hmm. it. Especially if it's someone we but, know. Again. Chas part of with him. No, exactly. Even, <laughs> even if you can say, I talked to that guy a million times, wouldn't even listen to me. Forget about it. What? what? So I, I ah, now he's. So I, I, I said specifically, it's a very powerful statement what he's quoting from the Shulchan Aruch. And I don't know how we can. I'm not arguing with him. I just want to understand. I don't understand it either. Because to me, that's a power. I mean, listen. To say that you you don't have to be sad is one thing. To say you don't have to be you're not obligated to be sad is one thing. But to say that you have to wear white clothing, which is like a sign of happiness and purity, and to say the word sameach and ochlim to eat and drink and to be sameach, that I can that's already like one but next, next level. So next level, right? So now I don't think anyone today would say that that's the case anymore. Uh, but again, uh, but not. right, but that's why I said specifically before I started the statement saying is this probably doesn't apply to me today anymore. Yeah, it's a more of a right. He's using it more of a proof of saying is that the people who died, not to say that they deserve to die. It's not that they deserve to die, but rather that the punishment. Hashem, is, in some ways, you can look at it the other way. You could say is Hashem showed pity on these people to not make them die, not allow them to die in the middle of the day, but rather do it at night, so that way it was a little bit less obvious. A, but at the same time, the people who did survive, they felt that. They could sense the. Um, they didn't want to be included. The people who did, who died didn't want to be included. And therefore, the people who did survive were saying, "Is thank God we're surviving." Thank God, Hashem says, "You know what? I don't want to say God forbid that they deserve to die because that was very hard to say. It's a very tough statement to say, yeah. right?" Will you be there showing happiness that? Hashem did it in a discreet manner. So in, interestingly, he says something very similar to that at the end here. He read a discreet manner. He accepted. They accepted the fact they were. They may have been disappointed or sad, right. but they still would have said is at least they were. You know, they died peacefully, if you will. Right? They, they didn't. It wasn't like some big thing. They just did it in the middle of the night, quietly. We know this was coming, kind of thing. Whatever. Now again, I'm not saying I don't understand this whole. Thing, but it's just an interesting thing. And therefore, he says, look at he says. You wouldn't understand it. I would be standing, not standing. Right. So he says here. So it says here, and this is what he says. He says, is, therefore, their, their, their relatives didn't mourn for these people. Rather, the opposite. He says that rather... That they were, they were, you know, in some ways, happy. He uses a simcha. I don't know. Again, the word simcha is a powerful word to me. Uh, I'm not sure what it means here, but he says this. But rather, he says this in the olden days. He, he I kind of brings another example. He says in the olden days, when you would come back on your way back from the cemetery, you would do is what's called moshavot, ma'amadot. They would sit down for a few minutes, then get up and sit down again. Sit, get up, sit up, and again. Right? Mm-hmm. They wouldn't sit down. For these people, B'nai Israel, at that time, they wouldn't sit down for, out of sadness. And that's why it says, B'chol B'nai Israel, are you or the most wrote down, meaning they had light when they were sitting. It wasn't that they were sitting out of sadness, but rather they were sitting out of light and of acceptance. Now, I don't know what the arts were. I would be interested to see what the arts were. When they had to do that, this, this uh, ceremony of sitting and standing and sitting and standing out of mourning, rather they had light and happiness out of it. Because they, I, I, I think the idea is that they accepted the fact of what Hashem did and how, what steps Hashem took to even during the time that they quote unquote deserved the punishment, at least they did in a way, he did it in a way that's compassionate and somewhat, um, um, you know, respectful as opposed to doing it in some big way that, that the Mitzrayim would also uh, kind of make fun of them for it.
that's the uh, other piece of Torah that I have. What does he say? There? What is the there? extra word in the verse alludes to the explanation. Now, in previous times, they would make sitting and standing tributes upon the return of grace from the grave. Say, by the way, I went to that. Um, um, what do you call those people that work with the um, pottery? Pottery, right? Yeah. Pottery, uh, right? It's very different from what we do. Really? And the fact that I saw in the uh, indentation on the stone for the head. Where was this? Where did you go? Where did you go? Freaked me out. Where did you go? <laughs> By the Yara uh, Oh, okay. There's a <coughs> pottery cemetery. Oh, wait, what's that? Here, David. Here, David. Okay. Because ah, this is cemetery is one thing. Seeing a stone with the thing mm -hmm. that's made for a body and there's a head right. part, that's a little <laughs> freaky. <yeah. laughs> okay. Unbelievable. Anyway. What did he say? Uh, upon the return from grave says, the verse therefore says that during the Makkah of darkness, the Jewish people did not make sitting tributes, mashwood, in mourning for their brothers. Rather, for all the children of Israel, there was light in their sitting tributes. The term moshvotom, their dwellings, moshvotam, uh, can also be translated as their sitting tributes. The verse would then be understood to be saying that the Jewish people had light in place of what could have been sitting. That is, when they could have made sitting tributes for their dead relatives, there was light and happiness instead. So what is it, what's the summary? They did not that? mourn right. their dead because the ones who died were evildoers. Okay, so he, he this did. was how they were able to search for Egyptian houses. I mean, okay, so they realized that these guys were ill, whatever. But it still doesn't. Sinners it still doesn't answer the answer. The question of to be very, you know, the word sameach sounds very strong to me. Unless it's absolutely obvious to you, and you're seeing beyond the. No, again, like maybe I'm re maybe my sensitivity is reading it as trying to understand something beyond. Maybe it was that they were just so evil that they were just like. Well, they're so evil, they deserve it, quote unquote. Yeah. No, but they have to be <clears throat> an absolute clear, clear, clear clarity. Right. clarity. clarity. <laughs> because otherwise, I mean, uh, oh. do we ever respond mm -hmm. like that? Oh, that soldier, mm -hmm. right. that guy, yeah. please. <laughs> Has to show. Why does the case go? What? To death or case go? Something completely different from what it was two, three, five, nine years ago. Well, to dedicate Cebu, all of Israel is Cebu, mm -hmm. except yeah. everybody in Israel is a Cebu. Yes. Whether he keeps all the Tariyag mitzvot or ten mitzvot or one mitzvot, everyone is a Cebu. When you define a Cebu, like, who always like, is exactly as you, yeah, so everybody who are out is out. You have to worry about it. We're probably living in such dark times. Yeah.